With winter's cold closing in and the year's end close on its heels, it's time once again for us to gather round and soak in the cozy, aromatic warmth of a good old-fashioned dumpster fire. We anime fans have eaten quite well this fall, but there are some kinds of hunger, and thirst, especially thirst, that can only be sated by trash. As your friendly neighborhood garbage sommelier, I've taken it upon myself to put together a tasting menu of the most pungent and talked about trash of the now, and rate each entry on an intuitive, highly scientific scale that if you ask me to explain it again, I will cut you. Do not test me. Now, if it pleases, sir, madam, or other, might I also suggest pairing tonight's menu with a delicious and refreshing glass or shaker cup of today's sponsor, G Fuel. Available in a wide array of flavors and many fine vintages, G Fuel Energy Formula packs a proprietary punch of caffeine, antioxidants, and carefully curated chemicals to boost your energy and focus and, um, anti-oxidize your, uh, did I mention they offer collector's sets, like the newly released Pokemon-inspired Shiny Splash Box, and that you can get 30% off an order of any size using the promo code BASEMENT at gfuel.com? Well, you can, so stop asking annoying questions about antioxidants, and especially about the rating system. This is the hottest trash of fall 2021. Bon Appetit! When fall began, the most hyped, or, uh, whatever the opposite of hyped is, trash of the season was easily Tesla Note, which has been heralded throughout the anime community as the second coming of Exarm. It's not hard to see where that comes from looking at the first episode, which combines a rather rushed plot overloaded by exposition and character introductions with 3D motion capture assisted animation that looks mighty janky next to the likes of B-Stars or, hell, even Drifting Dragons and D-Side Traumerai. There's a lot that's just obviously very wrong with this anime on a technical level. Next to X-Arm, though? <laughs> This thing looks like a masterpiece, and frankly, that comparison is an insult, not just to the relative technical competency of Tesla Note, but also to the legendary trashiness of X-Arm. That was a show made by live-action filmmakers with zero animation experience and seemingly about as much experience making films. Tesla Note is clearly a product of still-in-development animation technology and processes, but it's also clearly being made by actual animators who, like, actually know how to animate stuff and how to storyboard a fight scene a human being can follow with their eyes. The hyperactive animation style of Tesla Note, with all its manic model swapping and zip-zoomy camera movement, definitely takes some getting used to, but it's also definitely a style that you can get used to, one that feels like a moderate refinement of what Hololive's been doing with their YouTube character skits lately, and what Sega was doing with Sonic Adventure cutscenes in the year 2000. Watch out! You're gonna crash! Ah! Which definitely ain't great, but is still infinitely better than giving your characters one animation bone for their entire face. And Tesla Note even leverages the strengths of that style to incorporate cool, creative camera work into its action scenes. It's not a great anime by any stretch. I mean, it's still on this list after all. The main character is kind of a Mary Sue, the plot about a secret ninja spy ring that made a deal with Nikolai Tesla on his deathbed to protect some reality warping crystals he invented from a different evil secret spy ring is as convoluted as it is Saturday morning cartoon generic and boy you you sure can tell that some of these animation cycles were captured from people running or walking in place but the music and sound design's decent the actors are really good and you do get used to the animation after a bit this is just a debatably ugly mindlessly mediocre piece of turn your brain off action junk food that's funny on purpose about as often as it is by accident X-Arm is an exquisite fractal nightmare made of bad ideas, misplaced arrogance, and literally zero talent that reveals unthinkable, maddening new flaws every time you gaze upon it. These shows aren't even the same species. 
I'm giving Tesla Note one secret lab quarantine room full of uncanny valley abominations currently being killed with fire. Now, on the subject of notes, if you were a teenage edgelord in the late 2000s, there is a 100% chance that you were into, or at least aware of, both Death Note and Mirai Nikki. They were the premier journal-based high school murder spree fantasy franchises, after all, and while their modes of action varied greatly, their characters shared a penchant for amusingly bug-eyed monologuing. But have you ever wondered what it would look like if Future Diary was Death Note? No? Well, Mr. Smarty Pants, Death Note's creators Sugumi Oba and Takeshi Obata answered that question anyway with Platinum End. Mirai is a teenage lad with ironically, no hope left for his future. His parents died in a tragic accident when he was very young, and he was taken in by a wicked aunt and uncle who gave him the full Harry Potter while they lived off his inheritance. Fed up with it all, he decides to take a long walk off a short ledge and end it all, but just in the nick of time, a gentle, kindly angel named Nase swoops down out of the clouds to save his life and offers him a fancy set of wings like hers that would let him fly fly around the world at hypersonic speeds, plus a pair of gem-like arrows, red and white, that act like Cupid's bow and kill on contact, respectively. And all he's got to do in exchange for those fabulous prizes is compete in an itty-bitty whittle competition with 13 other angel-selected candidates, the winner of which gets to take God's place when he retires in 999 days. Mirai isn't interested in the position or any kind of glory. All he wants is to find happiness, so he's basically the inverse of Light Yagami. But there's no backing out of this job interview once you're in it, and while while the competition isn't, strictly speaking, supposed to be a death game, there is a whack job in a Sentai costume acting like it is, so Mirai and his hot childhood friend, who also coincidentally happens to be a god candidate, are gonna have to team up and super suit up to stop that guy. Also, the superhero supervillain's motivation to become god is he wants to revive his emoto who's been frozen in carbonite. Platinum End does offer up an emotionally affirming, surprisingly nuanced exploration of the nature of happiness and the universal human struggle to find it for ourselves, but that's buried pretty deep in a story where the protagonist's first act is to brainwash his aunt into wanting to bang him so she'll admit to murdering his parents and then kill herself. A child gets brutalized and murdered on screen for pure shock value, and also most of the Shinigami equivalents have massive asses and titties that they get all up in the camera all the time. And that's when it's not using sexual assault as an excuse for Echi. Now, what you probably imagined when I said that the Death Note team made a Mirai Nikki clone was a version of Future Diary with some real brains, actual tactical complexity, and thematic weight in place of all the edgelord bullshit. What we actually got is pretty much the same quantity and severity of stupid edgelord bullshit, but with every fight and the lead up to it, padded out by agonizingly tedious, seemingly endless dialogue. Every time the show threatens to show us an ironically good time with some of that edgy nonsense, it throws on the brakes and makes you sit there and watch the main character mope for like 20 minutes. Mirai Nikki was nowhere near as good an anime or a manga as Death Note, but at least it was bad in a thoroughly entertaining way. Most of the time, Platinum End is just bad. It even manages to have a more insufferable protagonist, which I thought was impossible. Like, imagine if instead of just making shitty spur-of-the-minute decisions that fuck everything up for everyone, Mirai Yuki made you wait while he agonizes over the philosophical ramifications of his potential actions and future action scenes, and then when they finally get here, he still makes the shittiest possible decision when the chips are down. I hate this guy! If you enjoy being intermittently bored and infuriated, Platinum End is the anime for you. If you like being entertained, I mean, it sure does have some moments. And if you've got some buddies to fill in the gaps between them, you may have a real good time with it. But you'd probably have a better time watching a bigger, dumber battle royale. 
I give Platinum End four bins full of Happy Science Spirit interview books, which are smoldering but not blazing. Ghost and yokai hunting has become an increasingly common theme in anime over the last few years, and between heavy hitters like Mob Psycho 100 and Mieroko chan, it's become increasingly important for newcomers in the space to do something bold and different to differentiate themselves. Toilet bound Hanako kun offers clever little inversions of classic urban legends, Kimono Jihan injects shonen action into its supernatural mysteries, Inspector went for a bunny girl senpai esque kooky girlfriend angle, and this season, The Night Beyond the Tri Cornered Window, is bold enough to ask, what if you could, like, jerk off your soul, you know, and then blast away ghosts with all that soul jizz? Also, it's based on a yaoi manga. Maybe I should have led with that. So, like, yeah, there's this guy who works at a bookstore, Kosuke Mikado, who's been able to see ghosts all his life and not been able to see much else because he's got to take off his glasses to make sure that they're ghosts because the ghosts stay in focus while everything else goes out of focus. It's actually pretty clever. One day, whilst he's busy being spooked by a ghost in one of the store's aisles, a handsome blonde medium named Rihito Hiyakawa appears and, I mean, d do you want me to describe it twice? After that happens, and boy, that sure did happen, there's no more ghost there, and Kosuke somewhat reluctantly, but not that reluctantly, agrees to help Rihito hunt more ghosts. I'll be honest, I only watched the first episode of this, and outside the truly wild premise, it was kind of just boring and poorly paced. The characters do have a fun, if slightly uncomfortable, chemistry between them, and there seems to be a solid underlying mystery at play here, but even in that pilot, the production values were already scraping barrel bottom, and everything I've heard from fans of the property says the manga is just much, much better. Also, just being honest again, I'd rather be watching Garbo Isekai. That's more my kind of trash. That said, if you are a fan of Bizarre BL series, you might have a soul jizz blast with this one. I'm given what I've seen of The Night Beyond the Tri-Cornered Window, three ghost recycling bins full of ghost tissues soaked in what's definitely ectoplasm and nothing else, and burning a bright will-o'-wisp blue. Speaking of Garbo Isekai and weird sex stuff, I just created a segue that could lead into almost literally any anime. But today it's leading into the fruit of evolution. Before I knew it, my life had it made. Which is actually kind of similar in concept to So I'm a Spider, So What? After a god rolls up on a typical Japanese high school and enlisticizes all the students into a war with the Demon King, one geeky, unpopular kid ends up separated from the pack and must fend for himself in the harsh high fantasy wilderness, starting out from the lowest rung of the evolutionary ladder. Except, in his case, that doesn't mean a magical insect. Seiichi's just a short, fat, smelly kid whose bullies call him subhuman to be mean. And the thing about that is, do you remember the title of the anime? Those fruits of evolution are magical artifacts that allows whoever eats ten of them to, well, evolve into a more advanced form. Like, the main waifu of the series is a big, pink gorilla who turns into a sexy cave woman after her evolutionary conditions are met, and when Seiichi eats the fruit and meets his, he just gets taller, skinnier, and less smelly. So canonically, like within the science of the lore of this franchise, those mean kids were objectively correct. He was literally subhuman after all. If that sounds weird and gross to you, yeah, it kinda is, and the deep unpleasantness of it all is only moderately offset by the fact that Seiichi himself is deeply unpleasant enough to kinda deserve being dunked on like that. Like, he is so mean to the Gorilla Girl just because he thinks he can't bang her. Until he clears the first dungeon and evolves into Kirito, that is, at which point he just becomes a generic boilerplate isekai protagonist like all the others. And after that, the show's just kinda fine? 
I mean, it doesn't have much of a plot to speak of, more a series of harem introductions framed around low-effort JRPG parody skits, but some of the jokes, like the Adventurer's Guild being filled exclusively with weird perverts, are moderately funny in a basic low-brow sort of way, well, until the scene swerves from lazy BDSM jokes into even lazier homophobia. And that is far from the only dated thing about this anime. Fruit of Evolution seems to be intentionally aiming for a retro Showa-era style of cartoon gag comedy. You know, like the original black-and-white Osamatsu-kun. And, I mean, it's not really funny most of the time, but something about that casually stupid style of comedy does make Seiichi's OP protagonist antics, his constant ass-pulling of new abilities, and his novel-length stat sheet a bit easier to swallow than they would be in a show that takes itself more seriously. Plus, the retro aesthetic almost gives the series a pass for its low-quality art and animation. Almost. And on the rare occasions when it fully leans into the over-the-top absurdity that retro cartoon tone allows for, Fruit of Evolution can actually be decently entertaining, even. I mean, what other isekai can you think of where the protagonist gets romantically entangled with his talking horse? Unfortunately, it doesn't hit such shamelessly ridiculous creative heights nearly as often as, say, the hidden dungeon only I can enter, but as far as trash anime goes, Fruit of Evolution does end up feeling similarly digestible to that series, if you can manage to stomach those truly awful first few bites. But why would you when there's so much better anime and better trash out there to enjoy? I'm giving Fruit of Evolution two American high school dumpsters full of exceptionally toasty intelligent design textbooks. Now, if you're looking for a better anime and better isekai trash, then you won't do better this season than our penultimate selection of the evening, The World's Finest Assassin Gets Reincarnated in Another World as an Aristocrat. You might recall this show also appeared in the honorable mentions of Once to Watch Fall, and no, that's not a mistake. It's just that this series represents a rare example of certified premium trash. As an adaptation of a light novel from the same cursed mind that inflicted Redo of Healer upon the world, it's only to be expected that this show's story delves into some extremely dark, undeniably trashy territory while indulging in a thoroughly unapologetic male power fantasy. Yet somehow it manages to make that feel Definitely not tasteful or restrained, but it's a classier, higher-functioning sort of trashed. Part of what allows the series to get away with what it does is the element of its Japanese pop culture DNA that's not Mushoku Tensei. That is, the world's greatest assassin bit, which is clearly a nod to one of the most iconic, longest-lived characters in manga and anime history, Golgo 13 who you can essentially think of as the Japanese James Bond. Bond and Golgo are both operatives who operate on very different moral principles from yours or mine, always devoted heart and soul to the mission at hand, and ever willing to do anything, kill anyone, to get that job done. They're not good people, and we're not meant to understand them as such, but they are cool and endlessly capable people, and it's endlessly cool watching them do bad things to even worse people. With a character like Shield Heroes Naofumi, you, the common nerd, are meant to feel like maybe you could be that guy. With a character like Agent 47, or this anime's Lu Tuahade, my apologies to all of Ireland for that pronunciation, you know the best you can do is wish you were them. And just as often, looking at the shit they have to deal with, you end up feeling relieved that you're not them. Within the sensationalized narrative framework characters like this create, writers and audiences alike are permitted to explore and indulge in the darker, more salacious side of humanity while maintaining a healthy sense of distance from the often objectively horrible shit they do and that happens all around them. Actions that would just feel insanely creepy if a reincarnation otaku did them, like psychologically manipulating a starving orphan girl into swearing lifelong fealty or buying a girl out of sex slavery to add her hidden magical abilities to his party's arsenal, just feels 
kind of natural coming from a dude who spent the entirety of his last life as an emotionless killing machine working as a tool for shadowy wealthy elites. It doesn't feel like he's doing these things solely for the sake of perverse fan service, though this is the redo of Healer Writer, so let's not kid ourselves, that is definitely part of it, but rather because he's got a job to do, assassinating the hero, and he'll use any tool he can get his hands on to get it done. Even if he's trying to live as more of a human and less of a tool in this world, old habits die hard. And it's not just that the premise is more permissive to exploitative content, either. When the show does that plot about sex trafficking, it very pointedly cuts around the most explicit aspects of the abuse to focus squarely on the horrific psychological trauma those acts inflict on the girls. And it makes sure to establish full lives and distinct personalities for all of them before they're thrown into that mess, so they're more than just suffering props in someone else's story. I seriously can't believe I'm saying this, but the redo of Healer Dude apparently knows how to handle sensitive subject matter more tactfully than the Death Note guys. And he manages it in the same story where this happens. <laughs> Assassin Isekai is as unapologetically spandex-clad sexy and self-reportingly kinky as any Bond film you can name or any trashy isekai for that matter. It just understands that those sorts of indulgences are at their most fun when everyone seems to be having fun doing them, and it knows it can't tell a good story if it's trying to be that fun all the time. When it does want to dive into horrific subject matter, it commits to making that horrific, and then when it's done with that, the maid's boobies bounce around a lot as she flips around, stabbing dudes with the concealable extendo spear that Protag-kun made for her with his super special Minecraft magic. Or maybe we get an ass-eye view of a trained killer lining up the perfect magic sniper rifle shot. None of this is to say that this anime won't make some viewers deeply uncomfortable. Do I have to roll that clip again? It is very much a show for horny nerds who like their firefights with a side of cheesecake and maybe some dungeon play. But it knows what it is, never pretends to be what it's not, and always remains acutely aware of where the boundaries of good bad taste lie. And blessedly unlike Redo of Healer, its premise is so original and rife with storytelling possibilities that it never drags or gets boring between the weird horny bits. You really can't ask for more from your trash. I give World's Finest Assassin three industrial barrels of nudie mags and fireworks that are absolutely going off after the conspicuous red barrel that was next to them got shot. This fall has also given us the first ever anime about hockey, Pride of Orange. And as a lover of moe and sports anime alike, and more importantly, a Canadian, I feel obliged to toss in my nickel on it. I would just give my two cents, but we've eliminated the wasteful penny from our superior economy. If you're a viewer of Glass Reflection, you may have already heard some of my thoughts on the subject. There ain't no way some namby-pamby hoser idols who were a knitting club like a week ago are gonna beat Team fucking Canada at Hockey Bud. It ain't happening, eh? I fully stand by that unhinged rant. The show's introductory in medias res flash forward deeply wounded my patriotic soul, and also it's kind of shocking how little of the rest of that episode is actually about hockey. So much of this show is just generic cute anime girls engaged in boilerplate k clone shenanigans, with the sport feeling more like a second thought hobby than the kind of thing to which they'd actually devote enough of their lives to even have a shot at beating Canada. But that's only at first. They do get more sincerely into it as the show goes on and the rough, random-feeling opening act comes to a 
clothes. The animation of the sport itself is pretty solid, too. The creators clearly understand the technical intricacies of hockey, and there's some low-key hype to be had when the Dream Monkeys eventually play a practice game. But there's just too much downtime between each moment of rink time to sustain that hype for long. And most of the Moe character-building stuff the show tries to fill it with feels like something I've seen a dozen times before. I guess it's not really that bad in the grand scheme of trash anime, though. My Canadian pride makes me want to award it five Tim Hortons dumpsters full of what passes for donuts there nowadays, soaked in Crown Royal and lit ablaze, but I know, deep in my completely objective garbage critic heart, that at worst it's a single waste basket full of day-old bagels with cream cheese. With that, we've reached the end of- wait, wait, hold up, I missed an anime. Sorry, our cat, Kuro, you know, the one from the Godom Empire flags, has been really sick lately, and this week we had to put her down, so I've kind of been distracted writing this, and Deep Insanity, The Lost Child, just sort of slipped my mind. In my defense, though, it is an insanely forgettable piece of multimedia merchandising machinery that feels like little more than an excruciatingly drawn-out tutorial for the mobile game it's supposed to be hawking, despite ostensibly having an original plot. It's kind of remarkable how unremarkable Deep Insanity is, frankly. You would think that such a shameless knockoff of Made in Abyss and Shin Megami Tensei's Strange Journey would at least be interesting. Anyway, I haven't seen enough of Deep Boredom, the lost interest, to actually give it a formal rating, but it is on my shortlist for the worst anime of the year, so if it makes the final cut, I will put my rating there. Okay, with that, we've reached the end of tonight's menu. I hope it was as delectable for you as it was for me, and for those with the fine taste to add a G-Fuel chaser, that that was as refreshing as it was energizing. If you're still feeling cold and would like to enjoy another roast, I am in the process of roasting through a series of anime made by an actual, literal cult, and trust me, you are gonna wanna catch up on those videos before I get to the cult superhero trilogy with the Stan Lee cameo. On the other hand, if you'd like to hear some more even-handed and constructive, but still amusingly catty criticism, I recently released an in-depth review of Netflix's attempt at adapting Cowboy Bebop. I'm Jeff Thu, Trash Sommelier Extraordinaire, signing out from an ornately decorated cardboard box with a restaurant sign on the top of it that is also made of cardboard.